Uh, welcome. Uh, pleased to have you here for this uh, discussion with uh, Gar Alprovitz. Um, we've entitled this event Democratizing Wealth and a Sustainable Future. And we came up with that because it, it's one of the subtitles of, of Gar's uh, new book. And, and the full title uh, evokes, uh, let's see, Leo Tolstoy, Book of Luke, John McCain, uh, the do-it-yourself movement, as I read it, the DIY movement, it, it's called uh, What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American revolution, democratizing wealth and building a community, sustaining economy from the ground up. So a lot of ideas in there that we're going to hear about uh, today from Gar. Uh, we invite you to join the conversation online uh, at, uh, at AssetsNAF, and you can use the hashtag Democratize wealth. Um, so I've got, I know, a live tweeter in the room, and you can join us online uh, as well. So it's really a pleasure to, uh, to host Gar here at the New America Foundation. Um, he's, a, he's a big thinker, uh, followed his work for, for years. I, I consider him a historian, a, a political economist, um, contemporary theorist. I don't know how you describe yourself, but uh, these are all things that, that come to mind. Uh, he's uh, a professor at the University of Maryland at College Park, but really someone who's interested in action and uh, social change. And in that spirit, he was a uh, founding um, principal of the Democracy Collaborative, which is a partnership committed to uh, innovations in, in community development. Uh, and really for a long time has been engaged in, in a set of ideas that promote shared prosperity and uh, ways that we can respond to some of the rising inequalities that have, uh, that have taken hold. Um, he's also spent a great deal of time uh, looking at the world and exploring you know, what happens when we put ideas uh, in place, uh, into action. You know, what happens when we have policies that are designed for people and not corporations? What happens when owners become, uh, when employees become owners of their, uh, their companies and when ownership spreads and, and when wealth is democratized. Um, so here in the, in the asset building program, we, we focus on developing policy ideas that help families with lower incomes and, and fewer resources uh, access opportunities that help them move up the economic ladder uh, and find some financial security uh, over time. Um, I, I strongly believe that it, it's savings and assets uh, and wealth that, that play a special role. They open up opportunities, uh, new avenues for people to kind of move up the ladder. But they also change the way people think and, and behave and, and orient uh, toward the future. So, so democratizing capital is, is a theme I think is really one of the keys in developing a more inclusive uh, economic system. So we need to be looking for ways to do this, to implement it, to include everybody, allowing people to reach their full, um, full potential. Um, as Gard notes in, in his book, uh, though, the, the challenge is never before have so many people been uh, frustrated with uh, the current uh, events of the, in the economic system, fearful that it's not working for them. Uh, and I think this is also then an opportunity that I think he's interested in, in, in describing because people are open then to new ideas uh, about how we can direct our economy and, and shape um, our society. So in his book, he presents this case in, in very clear and accessible language for democratizing wealth and, and promoting a sustainable future. And uh, that's what he's going to talk about today. So we're going to bring him up here to uh, give you the highlights of his, uh, his book and his perspective. Uh, I'll ask him a few questions afterwards, and then we'll um, have an uh, extended discussion. So let me turn the podium over to Gar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reed, and, and thanks to the Asset Program here, and, and also to you folks in general for coming by. Um, I'll give you a very quick sketch of this, and then we'll get into conversations. It's, this is based on a, this book is very accessible. It's written for a broad audience, but it is based upon a, an ongoing, much larger research project that we have at the Democracy Collaborative. So one way to begin this is uh, just to tell you that I come out of, uh, I used to run House and Senate st staffs uh, and policy planning at the State Department for liberal senators and liberal congressmen. And I've been in that world and come from that world as well as the academic world at the, both the Cambridge University and at Harvard. And I would have, would have considered myself a progressive liberal uh, economist at one point, and, and in, in fact was. Um, and about 
eight or ten years ago, maybe a little longer, I think I noticed with other people the decline of the capacity of that form of politics, and let me stress this, to alter trend. That the trends of income distribution, wealth distribution, ecological change, etc., were moving south, and the reform capacities were inadequate to alter trend. And that's the beginning point of this book. Um, the book argues that indeed the traditional model of corporate capitalism that we and many Western European countries lived with was based, and the political economy literature on this is very strong, was based ultimately on an institutional capacity provided by labor unions associated with a political movement of progress, progressive liberals in this country, social democrats in Europe, and the institution plus the movements were able to use Ken Galbraith's language, to countervail, tax, regulate, and manage the corporate system. Um, and the, the literature on this is pretty clear. As labor has declined, and this is a radical shift in American politics, from 34.5% of the labor force organized in, at its peak in 1954, down to roughly 11% now and 6.6% in the private sector, and declining, the first fundamental argument of the book is that whole politics that I come out of, and many in the room may share, is in decline, and it is in radical decline, and not likely to resume. And the evidence comes in the long trends. The distribution of income is worsening. The top 1% over 30 years has gone from 10% of the income to roughly 20% of the income. And CO2 production has gone over 30 years, gone up 30%. The incarceration rate which is one people don't pay attention to, but ought to, has gone up at the same rate. We are now seven or eight times as many per 100,000 in prisons and jails than any other, Europe, any other advanced country, including Russia. So almost on med an income distribution, on wealth distribution, on climate change, there are long trends that suggest the incapacity of the traditional model to alter trend and a decaying pattern. That I also define as a systemic crisis, not a political crisis. Let me say what I mean by that. That the design of the system, corporate power balanced by another institution, the labor union, is a systemic design. We think of it as ordinary, but it is in fact a systemic design other than pure corporate capitalism, other than 19th century small business capitalism, other than socialism. It was a way in the mid-20th century, I put on my historian's hat and urge you to as well, it was an interesting form of the middle part of the 20th century. That's a charring way to say that that system is in decline. And the trends reflect it. Most interestingly and most importantly, the concentration of wealth, the basis of power in virtually all systems. And most people are aware that wealth is concentrated, but they don't often recognize it 400 individuals, this is a shocking number, hard to get your head around. You could probably get them in this room, have more wealth than the bottom 180 million people taken together. It, I often say that's a medieval concentration of wealth, but I've been corrected by medieval historians who say it's never been that concentrated in medieval times. It's very interesting. And to the extent systems are based upon in significant part, the concentration of wealth, feudalism was land, the Soviet Union was the state, 19th century capitalism, small business, largely farmer businesses. And to the extent wealth is the basis of systems, that means we are entering an era in which the corporate system is overwhelmingly dominated and not countervailed. So that's the bad news. And part of this book is historically looking that at looking at it historically rather than as a snapshot. The interesting thing, and what the book is really about, is that out of the failure and pain of this way of building a system, and because alternatives are not available, particularly the kind when I worked in the Senate we could pass, actually, and because the decay is worsening, in many parts of the country, not reported upon by the press because there is no press reporting on local developments anymore. The press is not interested and because of technological developments, the internet, etc., it doesn't have the capacity, they just don't have staff, 
There are many, many, many things that are developing at the local and state level that suggest the beginnings of an alternative, I hesitate to say model, but of an alternative institutional base for a politics perhaps at some point. So let me give you an example of this. There are, as many of you may, many may know, there are some 10,000 worker-owned companies in the United States. Most people don't know that. There are three million more people involved in worker-owned companies than are members of unions in the private sector, hardly reported on by the press at all. There are 130 million American members of co-ops. That is to say, that's 40% of the American population, co-ops and credit unions. And this is well established. The credit union is a one-person, one-vote asset-building institution. The credit unions involve taken together as much money as any of the giant New York big five banks. So very large structures that are one person, one vote bank, for instance. In many parts of the country, ideas like land trusts, which is a nonprofit way of owning land to control gentrification usually, which was a radical idea 30 years ago. There were two, one in Vermont and one in Southwest Georgia. Now there are hundreds all over the country that are building up, ch changing and democratizing the ownership of land through the land trust structure, another form of it. You're seeing in Washington State, Washington DC for instance, and this is another piece of the development, used to be that when the, the government invested in something like a mass transit system, a subway system, at every exit land values would rise and the developers would jump in to get stores and housing and so forth, that those, that those exits that were created by the public investment. And then the weak city government would chase after them trying to tax back some of the gains. Not anymore. In many, many cities, that land is socialized essentially. Not the government owns the land, captures the values and leases off and, and captures the value for public purposes. It's another form of democratizing ownership. So I can go on to give you the pattern, but what we're seeing, and this is the argument of the book, we are seeing because of the failing system and because the old progressive methods are not working and can't work because the institutional base is gone, we're beginning to see the development in many parts of the country of new institutions characterized by democratizing ownership. There is also great interest in new things that may happen. For instance, uh, many of you know about the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, perhaps not. The Bank of North Dakota has been there for over 90 years. It is a state-owned socialized bank in a very conservative state. North Dakota is a very conservative state, but it's an extremely successful public bank supported by the co-ops, but also the small businessmen and also the farmers. And 20 states have introduced legislation over the last couple of years to establish their own public banks in their states. So it's another form of this development and interest. Another part of the puzzle. In many states, the health care system, and I think this is going to be a very powerful trend as time goes on, and as the current and the Obamacare system and its faults and difficulties hit the ground, some states, 20 states indeed, have introduced legislation for single payer. Uh, Vermont is about to have single payer probably, probably by next year. California passed it twice. It was vetoed by Schwarzenegger. But the problem is that the system is creating pain and high costs that can't be resolved because the coalitions can't manage the power relationships with a result that you get more pain, in this case costs and people being thrown off the rolls. And many people believe, and I argue in the book, that that trend is also likely to lead to democratized ownership. Now what do I mean by that? A single payer system is a public insurance company. It's a democratically owned insurance company. That's what Medicare is. And so when the states begin to set up single payer, it is essentially democratizing the ownership of the insurance company and easing out in Vermont and perhaps California next different parts of the system. So there is a range of development underway, not covered by the press, that has a powerful cast, very American, very decentralized. It doesn't look like, that's an interesting part of it, it doesn't look like state socialism, it doesn't look like corporate capitalism. And one of the suggestions of the book is that it, we need to get our thinking away from these stereotypical models to begin thinking about how systems might begin to be designed, how they might begin to evolve in very different ways. And interestingly, in great part because of the American culture, this is not France. It is a go-to, roll up your sleeves, let's do it here culture.
that begins to invent new ways forward, which gives me a fair degree of hope about the expansion that I've been running into on this book tour all over the country. New people, every, every place I go, people come up with a new model that I hadn't heard about. Uh, that is out of the pain and out of the development, there is something building, which in many parts of the country is very practical, but has the basis of creating institutions, not just political movements. Let me give you a couple more things just in the time available, and then we'll have conversation. In many parts of the country, it is advancing quite radically in terms of power relationships. And the way to think about this is over time, how it's advanced. In Cleveland, Ohio, for instance, and our group has been involved with this, there is a complex of large-scale worker-owned cooperatives linked together with a revolving fund so that they are not just freestanding and with a nonprofit corporation so that part of the money made by the worker co-ops will go to community building. And the complex is also supported by the purchasing power of what are called anchor institutions, universities and hospitals that don't leave poor neighborhoods. So in this particular neighborhood in Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic is there, University Hospital and Case Western Reserve University spend four, three billion dollars a year, with a B, on purchases. That's apart from their salaries and apart from construction. None of it to this very poor neighborhood I'm speaking of, the neighborhood of 40,000, average family income of 18,000, mostly black. But now have agreed to put some of their purchasing power into this growing complex of worker-owned co-ops which has a community building aspect to it. And they're not small co-ops. Uh, they just opened about two months ago the largest urban greenhouse in the United States. Three million heads of lettuce a year is the production capacity. A very large scale industrial laundry to service hospitals and nursing homes. And a solar installation capacity which is likely to produce as much solar installation as already exists in the state of Ohio over the next couple of years. And they're building out from that. Some of you may know of Mondragon. It's partly based on the Mondragon cooperative model in the Basque country of Spain. So the, the concept is not only ownership developing, but in very difficult situations, this model has legs and begins to build out. Ten cities around the country are actively pursuing what's now called the Cleveland model. And again, note the dynamics. It doesn't work anymore to bring corporations in and they leave after the tax break. Small business has no real market. The training programs don't lead to jobs, and there is no option but to try something very innovative and new. And that's the larger dynamic. I can stand back from this and say at the national level, we are also seeing crises developing. Virtually every expert I know who studies the banking industry expects further financial crisis at the national level. And probably the next stage when the next one hits is break, up, break them up. That's the current hope for, uh, I, th I think, Nostrum, break them up. Because what we know from history is that when you once, the break, once you break them up, they will regroup. And the big fish will eat the little fish, and we'll be back where we are. At some point down the line, uh, the book argues that the old conservative economists from the Chicago School, Milton Friedman's teachers, were right on this subject. And I'll just give you a little bit more, and then we can sit down and discuss this. And I like to tweak folks with this because I'm a follower of the old, I'm a liberal, obviously come out of liberal economics, and I was trained by the left Keynesians at, at Cambridge. But the old conservatives who trained Milton Friedman argued, and they got Nobel Prizes for this, they argued that some corporations, the big banks in particular, were too big to regulate. They would capture the regulators. And the whole theory of regulatory capture was developed by small entrepreneurial uh, free enterprise economists. And then, they argued, if you broke them up, they would regroup. The big fish would eat the little fish. And Milton Friedman himself came to that conclusion later, which left, quoting the founders of the Chicago School of Economics, which left only the option in some cases of, of socializing them. And I suspect that argument will come back over time as things begin to develop in another way, as the recapture and the breakup doesn't happen. But th another way to say that is this book and this argument is about historical possibilities and change, not simply the next election. So let me say a little bit more about that, then I'll sit down and we can go at it. Um, most of the developments that became the New Deal were developed at the state and local level first in the two or three decades before the New Deal. And only when the moment of crisis and change and only after sufficient development at the local and state level in the so-called laboratories of democracy 
was there a possibility of going to the national level? In this book, the same is true if you think about the women's movement in the 19th century, only agonizingly state by state by state by state, and finally national. Or if you look at what's happening with, with marriage in terms of gay marriage, state by state by state, and probably only ultimately nationally. The book suggests that because of the failure of the current paradigm and the radical decline of labor and that old institutional model that I certainly was brought up with, as that decays, the possibility of a new model is emerging. And its primary characteristic is the slow democratization of wealth and the creation of ideas concerned with the democratization of wealth, giving an institutional trajectory of great interest and possibility out of pain and necessity. Now, obviously, the question is whether over time that becomes part of a politics. At this point, it's institutional development. And the argument of the book is that there, there are many options, one of which is simply decay. Rome did decay. Violence could occur as we decay. That's another possibility. There could be violence and repression of some kind of corporate state. But it is also within the range of possibilities that the creation of this direction of opening a very democratic picture of what the society might involve in terms of democratizing ownership may, with a new politics, begin to move in a positive, creative direction over time in the model of building from the bottom up in the prehistory of the next great change, as, as with the New Deal. And obviously, I suggest that the place to put your energies is to defend whatever can be defended in the old model, but also the creative part of what's happening around the country. And many, many young people are involved in this, not reported on by the press. The creative part of what's happening is the so-called new economy movement, which is involved with these kinds of ideas and also their ecological dimensions of that, which we can again talk about in conversation. So I think I've used up my 20 minutes. I better sit down. Thanks. Have a seat. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot to, uh, to dig into there. I certainly want to talk uh, more about concepts of democratizing wealth and, and spreading uh, ownership. Um, but I got a couple of uh, questions for you, and then we can, we can open it up to, to discussion. But I actually wanted to start with history. Um, you know, you focus on some uh, historic eras that, that unfold. And of course, one of the characteristics of this recent period has been the divorce between rising productivity and wages. We've had wage stagnation kind of in this, uh, you know, from the, from the late 70s on. Um, and this has occurred, though it's kind of led to these new inequalities that, that, you, that you describe. But it, it's also been at the same time where we've had growing kind of political rights uh, that have emerged. And, and um, uh, you know, what we might call kind of movement politics. Um, and I think you're, you're a little bit maybe more skeptical of the potential of that and wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about exploring, is there a relationship between expanded political rights and what you see going forward in, in kind of economic equity? Well, it's very interesting. I was, I was just up at Cambridge doing a commemoration of Martin Luther King's visits to Cambridge in the 1960s. I was involved in some ways with, with Dr. King. And King came to, conclude, came to the conclusion in the later part of his life, and I, I agree with him, that the fight for rights was absolutely essential. But that was getting into the system. But changing the system so you got equity out of the system was a whole other problem. And if you read him carefully, he was clearly moving in the direction of some form of altering the dem democratizing ownership as a way to kind of transform the system. So I do think there are different paths. We, paths. we run a very successfully over great agony in, in terms of rights to get in and political rights. But that does not alter the system question. And I, so I, I think you get the economic failure of what we're getting at the same time people get in. Uh, and that's really the American kind of dilemma, which I think we've got to chat with the challenge is to move in a new direction to do both. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, obviously, King's focus on poverty issues and kind of poor people's campaign toward the end of his, his life did, um, you know, was underway. And, and beyond. He was in his private papers and in many places, even publicly, he was talking about a fundamental restructuring of the system. It's not well known, and I yeah. didn't know it until doing some research on it. But he was saying the war on poverty, fighting for poverty issues, doesn't work. Yeah. The question is, how do we begin talking? And I don't think he had an answer to that, but he certainly was aware that, and talked about it to his staff and even publicly that the, the system itself somehow needs to be democratized and restructured economically. Yeah. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, piece I wanted to dig into a little bit was, was this um, 
you know, ways to respond to kind of corporate uh, dominations. Cl clear so source of trouble. I've, I've got a colleague here, Barry Lynn, who does a lot of work on, on concentration and consolidation, uh, in, which has hit levels uh, you know, ex beyond what they were in the, in, the, in, the, in the robber baron period. Virtually every sector of the economy has, has levels of, of concentration now. And, and, and unions, historically, as you noted, had been this countervailing force. And, 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 and you don't see any very limited role for them in the future. Um, but, but, but what else can replace them? Give me a little bit more about what these new institutions might, might look like. First, let me say, I, I think Barry's work is terrific. terrific. Uh, I disagree with his hope that we can break them up. I think the political capacity to do that, but he's laid out the picture of concentration better than anybody that I know, and yeah. it's really important work. Um, look, I, I see this as a historical development, not simply a quick answer. I think times in many ways are going to get worse. I think the concentration of power is going to increase, and I think that the, the pain that that is causing is likely to increase. I think we are into an era, this is very hard for people to grasp, particularly living in Washington, that we may be at a time of the prehistory, like the last three decades of the 19th century is a good kind of marker. The time when something is really going wrong, but also there's struggle and exploration and rethinking and experimenting at the grassroots level with different models. Uh, so that's how I see it. I, I think the countervailing to the corporations is, in, is, is the keep them in place and try to hold them in line by regulating them. The alternative model is, think about the Vermont model I mentioned. If Vermont goes to single payer, and it's highly likely that it will, this is not countervailing and regulating the insurance companies. It is displacing them and putting something else into place, a public corporation. Uh, at the local level, the mayor of Cleveland has a new alternative for economic development by looking to this expanding model of economic development rather than the corporation, which is being displaced in terms of power. If these models expand, that I think is the trajectory of change that more and more democratization becomes a viable possibility. Now, there are a lot of ifs in that statement. If the pain continues, if the models continue to expand, if there's a political development along with it. Um, again, I, the press doesn't cover much of this, but if you get out around the country and, and talk to younger people and see what's going on in some of the cities, I was also in Atlanta, Recently, they are doing something called Lettuce Works. What is that? A large kind of greenhouse under public ownership or quasi-public ownership or democratized ownership is the phrase. There is more happening than I think people in Washington realize. Right. And so these institutions are going to emerge organically with kind of self-organizing um, entities. They're going to also be legal, like community development corporations that have been active for a number of years. Yes. Uh, it'll be a whole range of them. And so, w w what about the, the role that the state and policy plays, both at the federal level and the municipal uh, level? I mean, you know, th these things are just like the market is created by government and by policy. So are these institutions good, good, enabled? Good question. Uh, you mentioned the CDC movement. As we yeah. talked earlier, I was very much involved in the creation of the early CDCs when working in the Senate and so forth. Uh, and the CDCs, as we talked about earlier, the original model for CDCs was an ownership model, not simply to set up housing and small business, and, and that was changed in the Nixon administration and partly by the Ford Foundation. But I, I think it isn't simply that I, at least I certainly don't expect this organic development to magically kind of grow out of nowhere. That is happening. Uh, the trick will be whether or not a new politics picks up on it and builds a, a political base along with an institutional base. And that's the same thing happened and again in the pre-New Deal in the 19th, late 19th century. A politics came along with the institution. Building. Along with the municipal and state level exactly. action. So that, you still have that relationship, but with the politics new, has to form as well. Politics must form, but with a different institutional undergirding mm -hmm. and a different institutional thrust. That is to say, these folks involved in these various projects are already beginning to get the state into involvement and help out with public programs at the state and local level, national procurement, there are many things they want from the state. And since they're all businesses anyway, they're also using many of the things that business takes for granted from the state. But ultimately, if there is a growth of this, and, and I think there will be, there are many ifs how far it will grow, clearly it's already clear that they will want things from the government and from the state to further this development. 
uh, loans, technical assistance, grants, etc. Everything that business itself is asking for, right. but for democratized ownership. And we, we shall see. Uh, again, I wear a historian's hat. Um, and if you look at the way movements develop historically, including the labor movement in its early years, uh, that's the way it happens. And again, in Washington, we kind of are looking at the next election or the next headline. If you stand back and ask, how do these things change, you get a little sense of there is some driving force and largely pain, largely pain, things getting worse that force people to explore these alternatives. So I am cautiously optimistic both that this is a positive development and possibly it may lay the groundwork for something far more interesting if we see it in, in time and if people begin developing a politics around it. We, we'll see. The book ends with a lot of different options, uh, some of which may, may go nowhere and some may go very far. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, we'll, we'll open it up in, in, in a moment here, uh, a little bit more about uh, your, your thoughts on the banking sector and financial services generally. I mean, this is another area of the economy where we, we've had massive concentration. We had massive failure. The state did step in um, in a particular way, maybe not the way uh, either of us would have carried it out. Uh, last year, you, you did write an op-ed in the New York Times uh, kind of calling to argue to kind of nationalize uh, the big banks. But it seems like you feel like there's promise at these, uh, at the local level too, with, with credit union models where there is kind of uh, one person, one vote um, uh, governance. Uh, and I'm just wondering for you, uh, your, your thoughts on, on where the credit union movement and, and responsible lending might, might go. I mean, it's out there, it has a history, uh, but it doesn't seem to be increasing its market share. Um, the, uh, the New York Times article that you, you recall was simply recapitulating the conservative argument and that the conservatives had argued if you can't regulate them, the only thing that's left is nationalizing them and the, right. they, they were having, and the, the Times enjoyed having fun with that argument. But I think that's right. I think the conservatives were right. If you can't regulate them, so let me toss it at you. It's a very nasty argument. If it is not possible given the power relationships to actually regulate them, and if you break them up, they will regroup, and you can't regulate them. The old conservatives, who certainly were not socialists, said the only way to preserve a free market is to publicly take them over. Very clear, strong argument on principle, not, a, not about politics. So I think that argument uh, is probably right, and I think we may see that, because I don't think you can regulate them. On the other hand, I do think it's the credit unions can, uh, the credit unions in this country have been very stagnant, they are very large, but there is a growing movement within the credit unions to begin to liven them up and begin to get a little action out of them. So that's one piece of it. I think we're going to see state banks developing along the lines of the public banks of yep. North Dakota. And I'm a decentralist. My, my argument would be whatever can be done at the local level and the state level only, as the Catholic Church really argues, only in the end, in the theory of subsidiarity, only when necessary move to the national level. Mm -hmm. But this is a process where I think you're seeing, I was in one, one state, to just give you a story about this. Uh, credit unions are one person, one vote banks. They have as much capital taken together as any of the big banks. And nobody goes to the meetings. That is to say, they're boring. Nobody ever goes to the board meetings. People in one state, I'll, I'll leave that aside, realized that they could join the credit union, go to the annual meeting, nobody else was there, and they could elect the board and do much more creative things. That little idea is percolating and beginning to nudge some of the credit unions into much more interesting loan practices than simply cars and houses was basically what they right. do. They are limited to a certain degree of what they can do, but there's a lot of openness. But for many people, the, the, the kinds of financial services they can get at the credit union is, is what they need. They need an sure. account, they need to pay their bills, they need a, a loan. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, high on, on what they can do, but I'm concerned about the stagnant uh, yeah. uh, nature there. Um, we'd like to see some opportunity. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, open it up for some, some questions. Uh, we've got a mic roving around. We'll go one, two, three, four, five to start. Um, and uh, okay, there you go. Uh, thank you for holding this event and thank you for um, speaking and sharing with us today. Um, on the question of these, you know, uh, starting these institutions, um, but the need to, to, for them to also, for there to be a politics that develop alongside them. Um, 
I'm a little concerned about um, the, the inclusiveness of that kind of politics if it ever develops. Um, and my thinking is, you know, I went to a briefing at the uh, Economic Policy Institute recently, and the sort of the main point that stuck out at me was that um, black unemployment at its best of times mirrored white unemployment at its worst of times. Mm -hmm. And that has been true since before, you know, the Great Recession. Um, but in my work in DC so far, I have already encountered um, some resistance to targeted approaches, um, you know, towards communities of color and incarcerated folks who are trying to re-enter communities um, in favor of a, well, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, let's mm -hmm. do general strengthening of certain programs and things. Um, do you see that kind of uh, discord? Mm -hmm. um, so when you build yeah, these, these new kind of institutions, movements. how you can make them inclusive ones? Uh, no, I, I, I agree with the concern. And the Cleveland model, for instance, is in an ent almost entirely black neighborhood and almost entirely black participation. Um, and similarly, in Atlanta, we're seeing the same thing. But I, unless the model begins to develop in many communities and particularly is inclusive, uh, I think it's a failure. Uh, and I think, but I also think that requires intention the decision to do that as a clear intent. And I think that's a part of the next stage. And that is within the capacities of, of people like folks in this room to, who are concerned about politics to make that happen. Uh, but I do think it's open. We are finding in communities of color very great interest in this. And we, there's some work being done in Texas, in Amarillo, Texas, which is Hispanic as well, uh, very inclusive models. So it requires facing the question as you've posed it, but also getting intentional about it. But I think it is open to that direction. I'm going to be quick. Robert Charette, International Investor, but try to sneak two quick ones in. One, there's something I don't know if your book addresses. It's uh, the power of the markets, rarely exercised from what I can see. But let's say California, for example, would say, you know, thou shall not sell gasoline unless it meets our certain standards. Thou shall not sell too many automobiles unless some of them are electric. There is a power there when, when you know, the political will's there. Do you see a place for that more? And, and if I could, real quickly, your second question about the press not, not covering the, some of the, the notable things going on in this area, does that mean they've also failed in terms of covering some of the problems uh, associated with it? Let, so let's take the second part first and then go back to the, I, I think the press has failed. And I think it's partly a less interest in these questions. I mean, the ownership of the press is conservative in terms of business press and its business ownership. But I think it's overwhelmingly from a different perspective, namely the press, the newspapers and television are in severe financial crisis. And they have cut staff everywhere. And this is the easiest place to cut staff, what's going on in local grassroots developments at the st and the state levels. The coverage of state legislatures is ridiculous in terms of press coverage. So it's partly lack of interest, partly conservative nature of the press, but most overwhelmingly fiscal problems, financial problems. I do think there's a role, just to go back to your first question, uh, and you, not, not surprisingly, you picked California, which w is one of the states with a substantial labor movement. And it's different politics, I think, because of that, and partly because of the Hispanic nature of a good part of the labor movement. You, the politics of California is somewhat different from many parts of the country. I always get this question when I speak in California. Wherever the state can be playing a positive role, as it did in the older days nationally as well, in my view, I certainly think that I favor that. I, I'm not interested in creating more damage. But I, but I think there are very few parts of the country where that's true anymore, that the old model in which the state could play that role is available. It is possible, and this is the argument of the book, that if there is a new politics developed with a new institutional base over the next decades, as in the pre-New Deal, as in the progressive era, the institutional from the bottom up, there will be a new capacity to use the state positively. But I think that's the, and that's the direction I would favor. But I think that has to be seen as a historical possibility and an evolutionary possibility. 
I'll, I'll uh, respond to the media question. Obviously, the evolution of the, the media is a, a big public policy issue, I, I, and, and it's one that we look at here at, at New America and, and some other, other uh, formats, and some of my, my colleagues um, dive into this question. So uh, the, the business model clearly is broken, and it has implications for how local issues do get, do get covered. Um, and uh, I think there is a search for alternative ways of, of communicate, uh, c communication and, and, and covering uh, you know, the, the rise of journalism schools that are now playing a, taking over some of that beat uh, along with some other efforts. So we do have some colleagues here in the Open Technology Institute that um, are doing some important work on media that are worth uh, tracking down. Uh, sure, right here and then in the back. And then I see you too. Thank you for a very provocative presentation. Um, I had two questions, but they're brief. One, um, you say that the decline of the unions is not reversible, um, and I'd be interested in knowing your thinking on that. And secondly, you commented that um, if it's impossible to regulate these big corporations, as it does seem to be, particularly as they um, use their financial means to buy political power. How is it going to be possible to uh, nationalize them? Good. Well, the, um, What's the wh and when's the next crisis hitting? Uh, restate the first question again, please. About unions. Yes. Decline being irreversible? The, um, I think the decline is not reversible. I think they will continue to decline, with certain exceptions. Maybe California is an exception. And, um, and I think there are lots of reasons for that. The, the usual reasons that are cited is change in sectors, the globalization, that's, uh, globalization in particular has undermined the unions, and that's certainly clear. But the argument of the book is a little different, and it, it's a historical argument. Unions have always been weak in the United States far weaker than most other countries, and for, for good reasons. I believe the period of high union strength, which never got more than 34 percent, the Swedes were at 80 percent, was an aberration from the normal trend. So they, the unions were 11 percent in 1929. They're now 11 percent again. Partly that has to do with race. In the United States, the racial division, so you couldn't have a national union movement. The South was excluded, always, because of violent repression. That is to say, terrorism, Ku Klux Klan. Partly it has to do with scale. It's very expensive to organize a national movement on a continent. We tend to forget how big the United States is. You can drop Germany into Montana. It's much easier to organize labor unions in smaller countries. So I think there are lots of reasons why labor has always been weak, and then it's exacerbated by globalization and so forth. So now if you can sharpen again the second question, I'll, I'll try to deal with that. The second question is, if it's impossible to regulate, yes. Even the senators are saying they buy political. I mean, it, it's just common knowledge. But, the, I, it, it was, one of them was quoted in the paper today just saying how but they you, can't. You have to. <laughs> if they're the ones being bought and they, they're the ones for, saying it. So um, that you have to put on your historian's hat to do this one. Uh, the argument of this book as a historical argument is times are getting worse and anger will build. That and the argument of the book is you can't regulate them and you certainly can't do it now, and you certainly can't nationalize them. Although, by the way, did you notice we nationalized General Motors, Chrysler, and we still own AIG, the largest insurance company in the world? Nationalization is a certain possibility in the United States. It just happened. But the argument in the book is not that argument. It is that if there is an ongoing development of a 20 or 30 year form in which notions of democratization become conventional, from neighborhood corporations and co-ops and municipal, we didn't talk about municipal utilities. There are 2,000 publicly owned utilities in the country, municipal utilities. State level ownership, 27 states have shares ownership in companies through startup corporations that are publicly owned. Uh, you know, Alaska has a publicly owned way of distributing resources. If a culture and knowledge and democratization culture becomes conventional, at some point, some of the larger institutions, like the big banks, may well fall into that category, that all that's left to do is make them into public utilities. So that's, a that's the largest possibility over time of where this trend 
As I say, the book ends with different possibilities. That's one of the largest ones, system changing direction, which would democratize ownership at much larger levels. But again, I'm a historian. These kinds of things happen all the time in history. We need to stand back from our moment, thinking nothing can be done. And because the old system actually is teaching us nothing can be done the old way. And the argument book is precisely because that you're seeing something else develop. There's a really interesting statistic that some of you probably know about, which I ran into recently. Uh, people under the age of 29, I believe it is, maybe under 30, these are the people who are going to create the next politics. People, not my age, people under the age 29, asked whether they favor the word capitalism or socialism. Now, there's been three studies, three national surveys. Two of them come out, well, it's about even. And the latest one, 4% more favor the word, quote, socialism. The old days when that word was anathema, that was Stalinism. And I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised that we see many, many different forms of ideas. I don't think they knew what the word socialism meant in many cases. But it doesn't, it doesn't have that quality. I have to give you one other interesting thing. I have a piece in uh, alternate uh, this morning. Um, the, Obama, the Obama administration is trying to sell off the Tennessee Valley Authority. They, they want to have a little, they want to show some gains on the budget seat. It'll produce minuscule changes from the national deficit. It's the conservatives in the Tennessee Valley, the Republican senators are all fighting against getting rid of socialism in the Tennessee Valley Authority. So I don't know where all this will go. Great. Here, and then we'll go to the back row. Ibrahim uh, Mukman and Associates. Uh, my question is a little uh, similar to what the lady was talking about. Um, about 10 years ago, I was a consultant and in, in working in Flint, Michigan, and I had to put together a collaborative that included people from General Motors and the UAW. And I was just struck that the union was not more interested in doing stuff to own companies. And you talked earlier about, I think, some 10,000 worker-owned companies. And it seems like to me, with, with billions of dollars in, uh, what do you call it, uh, pension funds and other things, one of the ways to help move the needle in the, in the other direction would be to help some of the workers become owners of plants. Does that make sense or is that illogical? No, that, that's, that's a very interesting argument. And I, because what's happening is some parts of the union movement, the light bulb has gone on that you've mm -hmm. just pointed to. Mm -hmm. So let me give you just, a, and again, I want to give you this historical perspective again. I was, I was called in to help workers in Youngstown, Ohio, mm -hmm. in, the, in the first big steel closing, 1977. Youngstown sheet and tube went down. 5,000 people lost their jobs. It was national news had all over the country because no one had, we hadn't seen that in the United States. 5,000 people lose their jobs. Now it's very common, so it's not news. And the workers in that locality and the local ecumenical coalition and the local mayor said, why don't we put this mill back to work under community worker ownership? It could be done. And the Carter administration financed a very sophisticated study, and I was the supervisor of the study. It was done by experts in the steel industry. They came up with a viable plan. The Carter administration promised, there's a debate about whether they promised 100 or $200 million in loan guarantees. To, to put it into place, the Republican governor, everyone in the state, the politics was done well. Rhodes was a conservative governor. Everyone is for it even the Republicans. And then after the election of 1978, it collapsed. However, they did public education throughout the state of Ohio. So you find lots more worker-owned companies in the state of Ohio coming out of the public education. And ultimately, this Cleveland development, I think, can be traced back to this whole cultural long-term development. But to your question, the sharp edge of your question is really interesting. In 1977, the International Steelworkers Union the, the guys who ran the union internationally, the National Union, were violently against the workers locally setting, proposing such an outrageous idea as the workers should own the mill. And indeed, probably undercut, along with the corporations, the Carter administration commitment. In any case, they, and I also didn't like all these upstart activists who might challenge them. The steel workers over 30 years of evolution are now the leading force behind worker ownership in the, steel, in the union movement. And they've, they've moved to the position that you, you've articulated. And there are several other unions that are exploring it, SEIU, for instance, and some others that have actually developed it. So there is a, there's a small movement within the union movement to build out their power in a new way, and it involves this direction of uh, worker ownership. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, let's go to the 
two in the back row, and then here and here. Yeah. Uh, I'm Norm Curlin from the Center for Economic and Social Justice. And, and a person who knows more about worker ownership for the last 40 years than most people in the country. Well, I, I want to congratulate you uh, for making the issue of democratization of ownership a central theme. And I'm hoping that other academics begin to recognize that there's another way to distribute incomes. You can distribute it through jobs, but you can also distribute it through ownership if the system is changed, just as the system was changed for worker ownership, as you know. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one uh, deals with the unions. And I, as you may recall, I used to work for Walter Ruther when he headed the Citizens Crusade Against Poverty. And he pointed out a way that if the workers could, could gain their incomes from the bottom line, it would not go into prices, and therefore they would be more competitive globally. So the ownership issue was central, and I'm just hoping that the labor unions will wake up and convert themselves from, from labor unions to ownership unions, which would also include taking care of labor issues. I think that's an idea that I think a person like you could help communicate. The second thing relates to, I, I so agree with you on the issue and the goal of democratization of ownership, but there are several ways to do it. And that is, uh, as you know, Lewis Kelso had an alternative way. He didn't call it socialism. And he used the word capitalism or democratic capitalism, which I, I don't think capitalism describes Kelso. But it's a just third way. They talked about justice. And therefore, in, and in that, I'm just curious, the, there are four pillars for what I call, and what Kelso would have called, the just third way. Three of them are conservatives. The conservatives will never argue against them. But it's the last one, the democratization of ownership, is what is the missing element in a national strategy, in a global strategy, straighten out the system. The first three, and this is where the problem of labeling it collective or nonprofits, um, it, the, 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 the four pillars are the restoration of private property in its original sense as understood by the founders, power, and also the right to the fruits. That's just a basic legal definition of, of property. So, and, and that has been violated under corporate law. And if you're a shareholder, you have no right to the profits, as you know. The second thing is the restoration of the market system into a just market system. And today, with concentration of ownership, you can't have a just system because you have inevitably the kind of concentration that leads to the corruption of the present system. The third thing is the role of government, and that's very important. The role of government the government is the only institution, the only social tool we've invented that is a natural and legitimate monopoly. It's a monopoly over coercion. And so anything, like you talk about the decentralization, it has to be decentralized not just to the state level or the city level, but right down to every human being as a fundamental human right. And this is even recognized in section 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It says everyone should have the right to become an owner. This is violated, you see? And therefore, I congratulate you for opening up the new dialogue. I think Kelso offered a, a, a system which we call the Capital Homestead Act, taking, taking from Lincoln's extension of land, which is a finite. It's, it's necessarily to all forms of wealth producing assets of land and all of the job destroying technologies, the energy slaves, as a means by which we can liberate the wage slaves, the welfare slaves, the charity slaves, and, and, and the me, debt slaves under the present system. Let me see if I can uh, respond. I just, what are your thoughts on Kelso? <laughs> First, um, Lewis Kelso was a, was a great maverick uh, innovator in this field. He was a, a corporate 
lawyer and, and banker who wanted to transfer ownership and indeed was behind the laws creating, allowing for the creation of ESOP. And, and Norman, yeah. Norman was key to that process. And it's a very important development. Uh, I don't agree with Kelso in some things, and there's a long discussion here possible. But Kelso was interested. He knew that ownership was a critical element and, and was very important. So I, I think he's, he, he deserves respect. And he also dis re deserves challenge and debate and discussion along the lines that we've proceeded. But the principle, Kelso was a, was a banker. What, what he understood, and this is kind of the way, he saw a number of his very wealthy kind of people who came to him as a, as a lawyer doing, and, and what he found out was they would hire experts to invest their capital that they had inherited. And because they had capital, they could borrow money or have their experts borrow money. So the person himself just had an expert doing it and could do it because they had capital, which was able to get more loans. And he said, well, if the public would be in the position of insuring loans and, hiring, and offering the capacity to hire experts, everybody could. everybody could do what the person who inherited could do. This is a conservative banker. And that was one of the interesting questions that came up, why we should distribute capital in a different way. He was not interested in the idea that most people who own capital actually did that much from a conservative point of view, not from a liberal point of view. And so Kelso is a very important figure in all this, uh, even though I may dif differ with some of, the, some of the places he ended up. Uh, he was innovative and he's behind the ESOP movement and, and it's very important work. Yeah. Uh, yes, here and, and, and here and then there's one more over here. Thank you. Uh, Art Domike from American University. Gar, you and I both grew up in Wisconsin, subject to uh, admiring and studying the Wisconsin models uh, of political activism and the progressive movement and, and all. Given what's happened in Wisconsin subsequently, although I do admire your optimism, I think that I find it hard to imagine that Wisconsin is going to return to what you and I liked and studied. Can you? At least give me a little hope. See, he just called you an optimist. I'm because not sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, you're, you're a little bit of both. Well, no, that's, it's a very good question. I am from Wisconsin, and, and uh, I was brought up in Wisconsin, Wisconsin progressive tradition. I worked for Wisconsin senators. And Where's the progressive now. tradition today? Well, here's the interesting thing. I have said, and, and the argument of this book is that traditional liberalism, out of which I come, depended upon an institutional base which is dis declining and disappearing. So I, do, I am not optimistic about the resumption of liberal politics. I think it's in decay, traditional politics. I do think there is a possibility, viewed historically, of the evolution of a new institutional base which involves democratizing ownership in many, many parts of the system that countervails, displaces the Vermont insurance company model and may begin to allow a base for new politics beyond as a historical development. Yeah. I think that's very real possibility as a historian. And I think people don't normally think of 30 year spans. But let me tell you, or I'll give you just a moment of optimism because I find that most people are lost as we all are in the day to day headlines. Nothing works in Washington, nothing ever can work. Uh, I, was, I was a kid in Wisconsin when Joe McCarthy was around. Uh, McCarthy was a Wisconsin senator, not only a national figure. You think it was bad nationally. In Wisconsin, they shot anything that moved politically. So if you had asked, can there be a progressive era in Wisconsin in the late 1950s, you knew certainly your pessimism was warranted. And then the 60s happened out of something you didn't understand. Uh, it doesn't mean inevitably that dark moments lead to progressive movements. But it does mean one ought to be very cautious about assuming that today's headline defines the historical era we're in. And I, th and I think that that particular way of seeing things historically is very conventional. All the, the apartheid fell faster. The Berlin Wall fell faster. The, the American Revolution, the a bunch of farmers and small merchants defeated the greatest empire. I mean, these, the phenomenon is, not, is very conventional of people not thinking they can do things and things happen. So I'm not... I'm not a rosy-eyed optimist, but I am a historian, and I think we ought to look at our own time in slightly different ways than you can't move anything in Washington, so it's all over. Mm -hmm. All right, last, uh, uh, um, maybe we'll get three comments, questions right in a row, and let him uh, respond. So let's start here, and then we'll move the mic around. 
you've been talking about um, the hopelessness at the national level and moving things down and the more hopeful um, scene at the perhaps state and local level, particularly on the subject of the states. The states seem to be evolving into very blue and very red states. And do you find any lineup with the more hopeful grassroots type politics that you're talking about in the progressive states, the, the blue states, mm -hmm. as opposed to the very uh, conservative leaning of the, of the red states? Let me respond to that quickly. Yeah, I because was going to say, I think we'll let you a, go one by one. That's a very good so question. You asked her to repeat her question. Uh, the Maybe. book argues, there's a chapter in the book called Checkerboard Strategy, which mm -hmm. is really red and blue states. And it argues, and this goes to the pessimism question as well, that in a number of states, the kinds of things I've been talking about are advancing very, and, and are likely to advance. Washington State and Oregon are probably going to be the next states with a public bank. I mean, it's more advanced there. We'll, we'll see if it happens. But in the checkerboard, the, it's like a checkerboard. In some of those states, there are going to be very interesting solutions developing, and new ideas and new practices and new political politics developing around this is al already evident in, in many parts of the country. In the other states, the red states, if you like, there is the old model, but pain levels as well are growing. So part of the argument is, as the checkerboard evolves, we may well see very interesting advances in many parts of the country, even as the pain that is incurred because of the red state policies creates more and more upset and diff difficulty in other states. So the possibility of beginning to transfer some of the learning, po learning in the other states may very well be real if you see it as a checkerboard. Great, and then we'll go in the front row here, and then behind you. Um, thank you. Um, I think that your observation about um, power relationships and, and renegotiating the power relationships is fundamental to your your theme is is worth exploring. And in that context, um, it seems to me that one of the transformative situations is the internet the development of open source. And we've seen, for example, a corporation like IBM, which was me, mine, you know, build fences, opening itself to the use of open source and uh, multiple providers, et cetera. So um, I'm wondering, when you look at an institution like your own, like academe, and, um, you know, we're going to these MOOGs, aren't they called? Um, there's huge fights in academe over, you know, where we should go with that. How is this transforming the delivery of education? Do you see people within institutions like your own, um, you know, getting out there and embracing some of these models and teaching kids? So certainly we've seen um, the cost of education, the debt that kids are taking on as huge burdens and, and um, you know, advancing beyond the inflation even in healthcare. So uh, that would be a place to to apply that. And then the other part of this is uh, the concept of frenemies. If you had the 400 billionaires sitting in this room, what would you be saying to them? How could they be your friends and um, you know, make use of them? We've got Bill Gates and Warren Buffett running around the world trying to redeem their souls saving Africa. I mean, why not America, okay? Well, first, I'd, I, I would welcome any of the billionaires who want to play. We, we have lots of things we could talk about anytime. Uh, but uh, and I do agree, and the open source possibilities are really important. And and speaking to but the the academic world, um, I must say that that there in some parts of the academy, and I don't know anything about the sciences, which may be better, but I do know something about economics, and I do know something about political science, uh, and I must say they are closed systems. Uh, I have. It's very hard to get any new perspectives through those systems. Uh, it's, it's troubling. I mean, I, was I did a PhD at, univer at Cambridge University, so I experienced a different kind of intellectual environment, which was much more open at that point. What happens is a, gra is a young graduate student comes in. The first five or six years of their training, they better keep their nose clean because they've got to publish in an important journal. And the important journals are controlled by the establishment. So they've, they close their minds. And then they've got to get tenure, so they've got to keep. And it is a very, very difficult system to advance and explore new ideas. So I think they deserve being broken open. And the MOOCs of the mass audiences are one part. 
and alternatives to find ways for more discussion is another part. Uh, and really just being challenged directly. Economics and political science particularly are very, very tight preserves uh, and I think are by, and part of the problem. But the technology is, is really opening the door in some ways that could be very explosive and very exciting, I think. These two will be our final ones. Oh, actually, we'll put you in as well. Uh, my name is Ken Sandin, uh, Healthcare Now of Maryland. Um, I was, appreciate your mentioning the Vermont single payer experiment. In Maryland, uh, we, I mean, uh, Maryland Physicians for National Health Program and its grassroots arm, uh, uh, Healthcare Now of Maryland, uh, we gave up on a six year campaign we had to get a single payer bill through the Maryland State Legislature. We have abandoned that because we got 50, 50 co sponsors. We can never get any more. So we've got now gone to a grassroots campaign. Uh, we've uh, aligned with uh, uh, United Workers. And uh, so we're going strictly grassroots with a Vermont style health care as a human right campaign. So I wonder if you might comment on that, particularly uh, how uh, your model, uh, how we might incorporate your model in what That's we're in doing. Maryland, you're saying? No. Yes. Well, Maryland, I mean, single payer is a public insurance company. That's all it is. I mean, we, we tend to fancy it up, but it's an important. All it is, it's very important. It, and it's, it's this displacing of the private insurance companies. But the argument here is, and, and, and I think we're going to see it with, even with Obamacare, that the pain levels in different states are going to increase and people are going to be feeling the pain. Now, corporations are now doing, there's a movement for what's called skinny policies, which is just very narrow, but with no health care. They meet the technical requirement, but they're terrible policies, and then people get sick and are out on the streets. The bankruptcies come from health care primarily. So I think the pain levels are going to increase around the country. And as that happens, I think the base politically for more movement in the direction of an adequate system, single payer being a major step in that direction, is going to be more and more available as time goes on. So I am a pessimist about the near term, but I think it will have ramifications that will open the direction in the long term. And I think it will happen. I think states like Maryland are likely candidates uh, for longer term change. Thank you. And right here in the front row and then final question over there on the Hi, uh, my name is Jim Loving from uh, Silver Spring. Question about the politics. You mentioned that um, in the early stages that this democratizing wealth model is, is expanding and that perhaps over time the politics would follow. Do you see today in the early stages, whether it be at the, at the mayor level, uh, any adoption by either party of, uh, of some of these principles into a, a platform? And then, uh, and this may not be your field, what do you think the possibilities are, similar to what happened with the Tea Party, which was an in part reaction to the system failure of a different type, of perhaps in 2014, 2016, 2018, it being adopted by either of the existing political parties? Well, I think in, in one level, um, it, these are just practical things that politicians can be for. It, it's not ideological in many parts of the country to say that it would be good to help these local co-ops. I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, and mayors can do that and are doing that. And so I, I don't want to cast this as a major ideological f crisis. I think if it built up over time and began saying we'll take on the big banks in a new way, it probably would be get, get more ideological and probably should because there's a big debate about what, what is the nature of the country. But I, I think the important thing to notice is that a lot of this is doable now and is helpful to politicians who do it. Yeah. And that is important. It is not it is a positive for way forward. Many states, many, many cities are looking at the Cleveland model, which is using these large called anchor in hospitals and universities. But the city government has a lot of role to play in helping this happen, and it is happening in many parts of the country. It's positive, not negative, and it shows, it shows you what can be done. When I, I talk to young activists about this, who, and there's a whole ideological frame about this, and I, my experience is the most important single thing is is what you propose practical? We have a problem here. Will it solve the problem? And if the model in Cleveland will actually produce jobs and ownership and changes, I'm for that. The Cleveland model is the ownership of the means of production by poor workers. And small business people like it because it makes sense. And so that's the key to this whole phenomenon. And if it works, yeah, the local politicians will talk about it. They'll, they'll, yep. they'll herald it. Uh, what has been the response of the elected officials in Cleveland? Cleveland's been very, very positive yeah. response of the elected. Been very, very helpful, and that, and it isn't seen ideologically. I mean, I come from the Midwest, 
small city, Racine, Wisconsin. You can translate these ideas into very, if they're practical, if they're practical, you can have a conversation with anybody, including my very conservative high school buddies in, in Racine. Yeah. Who, who, that makes sense, people. Yeah. Great. And final uh, question there, comment. Hi, I'm Marco Buttazzoni. I work on uh, sustainability, well-being beyond GDP. Um, and uh, I'm curious about these topics in the sense that um, these communities you've been talking about uh, are obviously good at uh, creating more wealth for people and, and providing incomes and so on. Uh, and I'm trying to think about how does it work if you also think about the sustainability component and also if you think about well-being, also not just economic wealth, but also quality of life, uh, you know, a balance between what work time and family time and what not. And so I was wondering if you can talk a bit about, you know, how these new institutions could uh, yep. play a role in, you know, in these areas that go beyond the economics. Yeah, that's a very good question. The, um, and it's about how, how this, the ecological issues are related to this. In, in my experience, there is a, an aff affinity between the ecological movement and the new, in, what's th there's a term of art these days, the new economy movement. And I've been talking about things that are popping up in the new economy movement all over the country for the kinds of things I've talked about. But also, virtually all of it is ecologically oriented as well. So for instance, uh, the Cleveland model that we talked about, it's not only solar installation, but if you look at the, the laundry, it is the greenest laundry in any part of the country, in that part of the country. It uses about a third of the heat and a third of the water by design being green. It, it's green out of politics and political concerns, but the hospitals, it turns out, want, it's good for the hospitals to buy from ecologically sustainable business and, and advertising it. So it's a plus in terms of that. The whole, the whole orientation that I'm experiencing when I'm writing about this or the research is there's a great deal of interest in how do we combine ecological sustainability in institutions, not just regulating. Uh, and where that, where that ultimately goes is, if you really want to get to the ecological problem, the growth problem, and you can't regulate the oil companies, what do you do about that? Ultimately, you either build up an alternative, they can't be regulated, and they must grow. The large corporations have to grow. They have to go to Wall Street for their cash. So ultimately, some of those, that whole system is, is in question ecologically. So there's a convergence of deep concern from the ecological point of view about systemic design that might actually produce results if you can't regulate them. And, and there's growing awareness. Uh, uh, James Gustav Speth, who you may, may know, was one of the leading uh, establishment uh, environmentalists, has just written a book about this subject, about how, how we must move beyond the traditional models. And it all comes to, together in the so-called new economy movement of the kind we're talking about. Great. Uh, well, thanks for your time today, Gar. Thank you thank for, you for coming to join us. I uh, appreciate you. it. What then must we do? Available across the country. Great. Thank thanks. You. Thanks very much. Rick.